Organised crime did not exist in the Ireland of the 1960s, but the troubles would change all that. Serious crime would become a daily event as Republican paramilitaries raised funds for their war. The rise of the bad fellas starts here. The spillover of the Northern Ireland Troubles would rock the Irish Republic to its foundations. Ironically, it was members of the cabinet who stood accused of assisting the emergence of a guerrilla army. This was the scene outside the Dublin District Court today as the two former ministers were charged. Just weeks after the murder of Garda Richard Fallon, Charles Hawhey, the finance minister, and Neil Blaney, the agriculture minister, were dismissed from office. Taoiseach Jack Lynch believed they were implicated in a covert plot to split the IRA and provide arms to what would become known as the Provisionals. In the years to come, the Provisional IRA would send crime rates off the charts. For the new Justice Minister, Des O'Malley, it was a baptism of fire. It was a very serious threat indeed to the very integrity of the state. While there always had been a tradition of subversion against the state, what was different in 1969 and 70 was subversion uh, within the state, within the very government that was there to represent and protect the state and its citizens. That made it so much more sinister. The arms crisis is the great defining moment, I think, in contemporary Irish politics. You were suddenly into a completely abnormal set of circumstances. From that moment on, everything was different. Different world. In the 70s, the story of crime in Ireland is mainly the story of terrorist crime. The organisations committed to political revolution were on the warpath. Nothing and nobody was safe and every source of potential revenue for the cause was fair game. People nowadays talk about the IRA as if it were a single sort of unit, but I, I was at that time actually faced with three uh, violent organisations because there was the official IRA, the provisional IRA and Serera. It was a fairly frightening scenario at the time in the early 70s. Armed robberies exploded. In 1968, there were only three armed robberies in the Republic. By 1972, that had risen to 123. Ireland was engulfed in a revolutionary crime wave. Bank robberies, post office robberies, all type of robberies became commonplace for the sole purpose of funding these particular organisations. And it's important to, to, to understand that during the 60s, you would have been dealing with four or five robberies. That is, the Garda Shikana would have been dealing with four or five robberies in the year. It increased then and it evolved into maybe 100, 150 armed robberies in the year. 95% of which I would believe at that time were carried out by paramilitary organisations, the official IRA, the provision IRA. Being in justice in the early 70s was like uh, being in charge of a fire brigade. You were running around all the time trying to put out fires. Uh, and uh, you could do very little constructive work. And all of these things, uh, these uh, extreme acts of violence and so on, and were all happening for the first time. And it meant that you had to concentrate all your efforts on that. I would say, and I, I say with absolute certainty, that the vast majority of the Irish people will not tolerate the IRA and want the strongest possible action to be taken against them. The priorities at that time changed over those few years from countering housebreakings and, and unauthorised takings to countering armed robberies, uh, gun crime and uh, paramilitary violence. This is Rusborough House near Blessington, County Wicklow, scene of what is now generally accepted as the world's greatest art robbery. An armed gang raided the stately home of Sir Alfred and Lady Bight. Nineteen rare paintings valued around £8 million were cut from their frames and held for ransom. Most crimes of a serious nature, in terms of extortion, in terms of bank robberies, were carried out by paramilitary groups. And in essence, they could be described more as organised crime. And it is fair to say, uh, to all concerned, that the activities of criminals would not have been the number one priority. Hey, what the hell are you? While the cops were sidetracked by the political mayhem of the 1970s, those involved in crime as a way of life 
are watching and waiting for an opportunity to make it big. Jill, there's good pickings if you know where to look. Me and Johnny, we know it's a good place. That's a cinch to knock off. Never been done before either. I'm thinking of having a look at it tonight. A week in the life of Martin Cluxton depicted the type of crime that was occurring and the type of person that was attracted to crime. Are you mad? Any trouble around here and I'm the first to be lured off the Star Street. Many of them were poor, from large families, badly educated and easily led. I keep them talking at the front. Johnny does the back office where the cash is. Be easier with three though. Many of them were young delinquents who had spent time in the brutal industrial schools. We are neither qualified nor equipped to deal with the work of rehabilitation. The end result is that most of the boys leave with this relatively the same attitudes to and aggressions against society as when they arrived. Amongst the ranks of the army of children that passed through the industrial schools was the future leaders of organized crime in Ireland. Christy Dunn and his brothers, Martin Cahill and his associates, John Cunningham and his crew. They all spent a lifetime hitting back. I'm not a godfather, I'm a good father. I think it was convenient for the authorities and the police in particular to have a family like the Dunn's, who I regard as just scapegoats. A lot of my family, my sisters and my brothers live in substandard accommodation that's been given to them by the corporation. The corporation have made it quite clear that under no circumstances will the Duns ever be housed in anything other than substandard accommodation. I feel that my family, like most other unfortunate people living in these areas, become victims. Dublin Corporation working class housing has changed very little in the last 40 years. You're dealing with people all of the same class. It's much easier to treat them like an army, to transplant them from A to B. They have very little choice in the matter. If a child is to improve, it will be in spite of the environment. Of course, um, uh, crime and criminals come from deprivation, lack of opportunity, lack of education. But in the very same localities, other families uh, do well and prosper and never get into trouble of any description. So there must be some responsibility on the individual. Criminals that I would be familiar with in the city would fall into different categories. There would be those who initially did it out of need. Perhaps family conditions, family circumstances were not good, families were dysfunctional. They had nobody to show them the way. And there are those who are career criminals in it for the making of money. Generally, what appears to be the case is that when legitimate avenues have been cut off, that some individuals, maybe because of economic or maybe even personality reasons, will turn to organised crime. Because in a business sense, it makes sense to commit such crimes. My research indicates that that's not enough to explain serious crime, in particular gun crime, that there are rational factors at play, but that there are also social factors and oftentimes personality factors also. I think the criminals that progressed in the area of crime, such as Martin Cahill and his gang, or the Duns in, and uh, the people that they were associated with, they simply um, upped the ante in relation to their activities, and it was the times that were in it that allowed them to change. Certainly, the Northern situation would have given them a, a different perspective and perhaps a greater incentive to become involved in armed crime. In the early 1970s, these career criminals still enjoyed an open season and hadn't come into the frame yet. In 1973, the political upheaval that had convulsed the state resulted in a change of government. There are now 70,000 people unemployed. 70,000 people, despite the grants that are available, despite the opportunities of better markets in the EEC and so on, there are still 70,000 unemployed. The National Coalition of Fine Gael and Labour aspired to improve social conditions and promote a fair deal for all. 
But those ambitions didn't survive for long in the teeth of a renewed IRA campaign. The activities of criminals like the Dunn Academy was never going to be high on the list of priorities for a government under siege. Major crimes in those days, and that would include armed robberies and kidnappings, my recollection is that they were exclusively carried out by the Provisional IRA and that the Cahills and the other major gang figures had not yet emerged. But they were obviously on the sidelines taking note. The IRA actually became the predominant issue. And it got to the point where I would say that it would have occupied half of our time on a day-by-day -day basis. We have to decide what the priorities are and to, to, to tackle these as we see them. The IRA at that point referred to us all as quislings and traitors. Uh, and at a point in this government, every member of the cabinet was under threat of assassination. By 1974, lawlessness was rampant across the island. The Troubles had claimed hundreds of lives. Murder was now a way of life. There's a man lying, his two legs were mutilated, his side of his head was literally cut off. There was a young baby. She was like a rag doll, she was all torn to pieces. On the streets of Monaghan and Dublin, a UVF bombing atrocity would take over 30 lives. In this highly charged atmosphere, organized crime was not on the agenda. In Monaghan in March 1974, an IRA outrage would reinforce the sense of siege felt by every member of the government. 35-year-old Senator Billy Fox was a member of Fine Gael and a government supporter. A Monaghan Protestant, he lived on the front line. I have very happy memories of uh, Billy Fox. He was only 35 years of age at the time, and he had a future in politics. He was bright, he was articulate, he was personable. He had all the things going that politicians are supposed to need. This was the Coulson homestead near Clones. Marjorie Coulson was to be married to Billy Fox. One night in March 1974, 13 IRA volunteers came here on an operation. Senator Fox came to visit his girlfriend, Marjorie Coulson, as he had been doing fairly regularly. But at the time he arrived, about 10 o'clock last night, the house was being raided by a party of armed and masked men who said they were looking for arms. When he arrived, it was a raid in progress by neighbours, I'm sorry to have to say. The raid involved setting the house on fire, burning family Bibles, a totally sectarian outrage. So Billy arrived, got out of his car, decided he, for whatever reason, he decided to get away. 